Hello and welcome to the second episode of Healthy India. I am Dr. Amrish Mithal and in this program I will be in conversation with top experts to bring you the latest in medical research and information. In the first episode we discussed diabetes in India in detail and today we will talk about advances in treating and managing diabetes. In the last episode, we learned a lot about diabetes in India. We know that it's increasing exponentially. Younger Indians are getting affected. We may develop complications. The truth that COVID-19 may have impacted us more simply because our diabetes prevalence is high uh, continues to be there. But along with this exponential increase in diabetes, there's also been a huge increase in diabetes research. And all is not dark and gloomy. There are lots of new findings about diabetes. One of them, of course, being something that we discussed briefly last time, the relationship between weight and diabetes. Interestingly, there are lots of newer drugs that have come into the fray for treating diabetes in the last decade or so. And actually, the whole paradigm treating type 2 diabetes may be undergoing a change. What is the dream for a physician who treats diabetes? or a patient who is getting treated for diabetes. We need drugs that will lower blood sugar without causing a low blood sugar reaction, without lowering it too much. No hypoglycemia. And we also need drugs that will at least not promote weight gain. And actually, it will be best if they promote weight loss. And it would really be a dream if we could have had drugs which will actually reduce the risk of complications. Over the last few years, these dreams seem to be turning into some reality. Two new groups of drugs have changed the way that we manage diabetes. These are the GLP-1-like drugs and the SGLD2 inhibitors. These drugs actually reduce blood glucose significantly but not excessively. So they don't produce low blood sugar reactions. Quite clearly, they produce significant weight loss. An amazing new study on semaglutide has shown that some patients can lose up to 15 kilograms. And on top of that, some of these drugs actually reduce the risk of long-term complications like kidney complications or heart complications. To discuss all these advances in diabetes, I'd like to welcome the three experts who will be in conversation with me today. Uh, Dr. V. Mohan, who is the director of Dr. Mohan's Research Center in Chennai. Dr. Sanjay Kalra from Bharti Hospital, Karnal. And Dr. Kamlesh Kunti from University of Leicester, UK. Welcome to the show. Let me start with Dr. V. Mohan first. Dr. Mohan, you are known for your contribution to the field of diabetes over the last several decades. Uh, your epidemiological studies have helped us understand a great deal about diabetes in India. The issue here now is that you have shown, as well as some others, that diabetes has increased a lot in India. But we also know that the advent of newer drugs is helping us manage diabetes better. Uh, in your recent studies, you've suggested that all diabetes can't be put into one basket. Of course, we know there's type 1 and there's type 2. Type 1 is the insulin-dependent kind of diabetes where insulin is required, more common in children, although it may occur at any age. There's also a type 2, which is the common garden variety of diabetes, which, as we discussed, is now occurring in people at much younger age. So, in type 2 diabetes, is it all like fitting into one, do these new molecules, will they work for everybody? How would you look at that? Or would you like to suggest some clusters based on your own research? Thank you, uh, Dr. Mittal, for setting the scene and also for referring to these different types of uh, diabetes. I think it's very important uh, to underscore the fact 
that not only diabetes is increasing in India and all over the world, but also that there are different types of diabetes. You correctly alluded to the fact that there are some types of diabetes like type 1, where if you don't take insulin, the patient, usually a child or a young adult, will actually die if you stop the insulin, even for a day or two, sometimes they can die. But apart from the two types that you mentioned, the type 1 and type 2, and I'll come back to type 2 uh, in a minute, there are many, many other forms of diabetes. In my experience, there are at least about 40 different types of diabetes. I'm not going to confuse this audience by listing out all the 40. But just to give you an example, in some parts of India, for example, there is a type of diabetes associated with stones in the pancreas. That is called fibrocalculus pancreatic diabetes. There is one type of diabetes associated with pregnancy. Only during pregnancy it comes and after the delivery it can go away. It's called gestational diabetes. There are endocrine forms of diabetes. Due to some endocrine disorder, you can get. There are monogenic forms of diabetes where due to a single defect in the gene, you can get diabetes. And in that, there are about 20 or 30 different types. So leaving all those aside, as you rightly said, the common garden variety or the commonest form of diabetes, if you say diabetes and don't qualify it, what would you normally think of? You'll think of type 2 diabetes. Why? Because this constitutes about 90 to 95% of all forms of diabetes that we see in India and in most parts of the world. So all the other 40 types are put together will form the remaining 5 to 10%. As you very rightly said, until recently, we used to club everything which is not in the other forms of diabetes as type 2 and say they are all of one type. And therefore, the, the fallout of that is that we used to give everyone the same treatment. For example, we'll give them, everyone will give metformin. And then if that doesn't work, we'll go on to the next drug. Uh, and it's not in any particular order or anything. Uh, there was a seminal work from Scandinavia which came out, uh, which showed that this type 2 diabetes itself is of several subtypes. So our group tried to reproduce those findings and to look at whether the subtypes in India are the same as in Scandinavia. What we found, quite interestingly, is that there are four subtypes of diabetes, type 2 diabetes in India, but these four subtypes are a little different from what is described in Scandinavia. Very briefly, I'll tell you what they are without going into too much of technical jargon. The first one is where insulin deficiency is the main problem, which means the pancreas is not producing enough insulin. These patients are usually young and they are thin. So when you see a young 25, 30-year-old person who's relatively thin coming in, we can think of this severe insulin deficient variety we call it as SID. The opposite of that, if somebody who's very obese, you know that there are people who even go for bariatric surgery. Their weight is 100 kilos, 200 kilos, 300 kilos. Their main problem is insulin resistance. They have terrible insulin resistance. They might, having, might be having insulin in their body. There's not much of deficiency of insulin, but that insulin is not working. We call this variety as the insulin-resistant obese diabetic or the IROD variety. And I'll tell you why they are significant. The third variety is where that's a novel type, which you found only in India not described in any part, other parts of the world, it's probably a South Asian variety of the type 2 diabetes. And this is called as combined insulin deficiency and the resistant variety. We call it a CIRDD or combined insulin resistant and deficient variety. And the fourth one was similar to what was reported in Scandinavia. It's an age-related one. It's called mild age-related diabetes or MAR, which comes usually after 50, 55 years in India. Now, why should we know these different types of diabetes. You correctly alluded in your introduction that new drugs have come for, to treat type 2 diabetes. For example, you mentioned the SGLT2 group of drugs. You also mentioned the GLP-1 receptor analogs. Both these compounds, as we know, helps you to reduce weight. So naturally, they'll be very suitable for the second variety, the insulin-resistant variety, and also in the combined insulin-resistant and deficient variety because there's insulin resistance there. Whereas in the first variety, the thin type, young age, insulin deficient type, probably they may not work as well as another group of drugs, which are, which are called as insulin secretagogues. They make insulin secretion better. And in this will come the DPP-4 group of drugs, which came slightly before the SGLT2, but also relatively newer drugs. What they do is to increase the insulin secretion. Of course, the old sulfonylurea, some of the modern sulfonylureas, as we call them, also come in the class, and that group of patients may also need insulin early. 
And the last variety, the mild age-related variety, you can treat in any way. They are older people, very mild diabetes, plain metformin may be sufficient. At best, you might add another DP before inhibitor and get them under control. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mohan, for uh, simplifying a fairly complex area, but emphasizing the fact that all type, seemingly type 2 diabetes is not all one. And as clinicians, as physicians, as diabetologists, endocrinologists, we have to learn to distinguish. So please go to your doctor, check where you fit in this, these criteria, and there, therefore choose your drug wisely in consultation with your doctor. It's not that if there's some new drug being launched, which is very good in general, it may not necessarily be applicable to you. I think this is important, and I'm also glad that you mentioned the liver. Uh, the liver is the other organ now that we're talking about uh, in relationship to diabetes a lot. I mean, we used to talk about eyes, kidneys, feet, and heart. And now we know that NAFLD or fatty liver is a common accompaniment of diabetes and can lead to various complications later on. And some of the positive things that have been found out about these newer agents is the fact that they can also reduce fat in the liver. Our own studies on liraglutide, uh, dulaglutide, and empagliflozin have actually suggested that these groups of drugs, that is again GLP-1 and SGLT-2, can actually reduce liver fat significantly, which may be another added benefit. So in addition to the benefits of these molecules, this is one whole group, uh, a whole area of advance, our understanding of different types of diabetes and the fact that we have better tools to deal with them now. There are also significant advances in monitoring. And as you and I know very well, that diabetes monitoring has changed considerably in the last few years. And we are now really talking of not just doing a blood glucose with a glucose sticks or even measuring an HbA1c, which is a three-month average of your blood glucose. But there are newer ways where you can monitor blood glucose much more aggressively and more accurately. Would you like to talk about that, Dr. Mohan? Today, it's a state of the art. And it's so simple. You wear a small little patch on your uh, shoulder, on your arm, upper arm actually, and then you just wear it uh, there. And it's just a, like a sticker it is. And once you put it there, that small patch, it starts doing its job. It'll monitor the sugar levels continuously. Every two to three minutes, it'll monitor the sugar. And for the next 14 days, almost 100 blood sugars in a day and 1,400 blood sugars over a two-week period without one drop of blood being taken. And it's instantaneous. It is constant. And you can see it even in a real-time mode if you buy one of those readers. So from the old, uh, you know, urine sugar testing where you heated it and boiled it, and then you also, you know, only if the urine spilled into the, the sugar spilled it in the urine, only then you find out. And even then, in some people, will give wrong reading. There'll be sugar in the urine, but uh, there'll be no, blood sugar will be normal. The opposite, high sugar will be there in the blood, but the urine sugar will be uh, negative. So all those things are now eliminated with this. And so now you have a choice. You can wear this occasionally, maybe, for type 2 diabetic patients. For type 1 diabetic patients, they wear it constantly. Before they eat, they'll check what, what it is. You just have to take uh, like a small reader, show it near your arm, and then you know what the uh, sugar is instantly, and then you can decide how much insulin to inject yourself. So a whole transformation, a kind of a revolution has taken place, and I'm sure the best is yet to come because these uh, sensors and so on are now getting linked to pumps. And using those pumps, the pump can then decide how much insulin to give you. So that's called as an artificial pancreas or a closed loop system. That is also becoming a reality. These are all things 20 years ago we'd have thought it's science fiction. But today it's all becoming a reality. Thank you, Dr. Mohan, for those two very clean and very simply explained phenomena of one of, of newer drugs and how they're impacting different clusters and, of course, the fact that uh, we have better and better techniques to monitor. And all of us use a lot of this continuous monitoring technique now, which has really changed the way we look at diabetes. But the last question to you is about the ultimate goal of treating diabetes. The ultimate goal of treating diabetes is to prevent complications. So with the advent of these newer agents, do you think our approach to 
reducing the risk of heart disease, kidney disease, uh, you know, has that undergone any change in the recent past? I think it has. I want to know your thoughts on that. The ABCD mantra will work. If you do the ABCD mantra, you can get there. What is ABCD mantra? A stands for A1C, HbA1C. You already mentioned it in your uh, introductory remarks about glycated hemoglobin or glycosyl hemoglobin, the three months control test. If that is kept below 7%, there is so much of evidence from so many studies in the world that you virtually eliminate two or three complications, eye complications, kidney complications, and nerve complications. Virtually, these three can be eliminated if everybody's HPNC is kept at 6.5, 6.8, something like that. You may not see much of retinopathy, nephropathy, and neuropathy. What about cardiovascular disease? If you want to control that, you need the B and the C. B stands for blood pressure. Now, there is a normal blood pressure for age. So depending on that age, if you keep your blood pressure at that normal limit, but let's take a rough number so that people understand. Let's say 140 by 90. If you keep the blood pressure below 140, 90, and the lower it is, the better, of course. If you keep it below that, let's say it's 130, 80, or something like that, then the risk of strokes and heart attacks and heart failure come down so much. Number three is C. C stands for cholesterol, particularly the bad cholesterol or the LDL cholesterol. If you can keep it below 100 or preferably below 70 or even 50 if you're a high-risk uh, person, which means your father had heart attack, mother had heart attack, and even 100 may not be sufficient, you'll have to bring it down below 50. Invariably, you'll need a statin to bring it down. And don't believe all these fake news which tell you mm. statins are bad and pharma produced all this. There is nothing called cholesterol. I don't believe in all that at all. We've got about 40 trials which have shown that it improves the quality of life. It makes people live longer. So if you need a statin or you need any other drug to reduce your cholesterol, uh, those lipid fractions, then that C part also has to be. So I talked about A, I talked about B, I talked about C. What's D? D stands for discipline. So that discipline includes diet, some kind of a diet. So people ask me, can I eat one sweet in my life? You can eat one sweet in a week, doesn't matter. But you keep your sugars under control and you adjust all your other diet. But have some kind of a discipline. Eat more fruit, eat more vegetables, eat more protein, cut down on your unnecessary carbohydrate junk that you're eating, cut down on the unhealthy fats, take healthy fats. So all that comes under the diet part. Exercise. Exercise is very, very important. Human beings are meant to move. We are hunter-gatherers. We used to run behind animals, catch them, and then only you could eat in the good old past. Today, here I am sitting in front of a, a TV screen or in a studio <laughs> and then talking to you. Most of the time, we're doing this. We're sitting down. We've become sedentary animals today. So we have to move. So exercise is very important. Number three is stress reduction. Today, with all the other things that we have, our stress levels have skyrocketed. And that produces mental illness, it produces stress, it becomes depression, your sugar goes up, BP goes up, everything goes up. You don't have sleep. And therefore, you have to do yoga or pranayama or whatever it is that relaxes you so that your stress levels come down. I mentioned sleep. Sleep is also very important. Both the quality and the quantity of the sleep are important. You must get into bed when God decided uh, that you should go to bed. That is the night time. That's why he created the night for you. So get into bed around 10, 10.30, Sleep, uh, you know, for uh, at least six hours, preferably seven hours, and then get up in the morning and then go for your exercise. Early to bed and early to rise makes you healthy, wealthy, and wise. That's what we're taught in school. <laughs> Absolutely right. Bang on. Correct. So if you are able to do that, that also reduces that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mohan, for bringing out those absolutely wonderful points. And to add to that, as I said initially, uh, even molecules that treat diabetes or high blood glucose per se are now being shown to reduce the risk of complications related to heart, kidney, liver, etc. So these new groups of molecules are the icing on the cake along with all that Dr. Mohan has told us. Along with the A, B, C, D, E mantra, if you use the right molecule in the right patient, these, these new drugs will actually reduce your risk of getting complications. So we take a short break now. And after the break, I'll be back with Dr. Sanjay Kalra and Dr. Kamlesh Kunti. The glorious journey of India's 75 years of independence, protection of rights, ensuring equality, to empower, to deliver justice. Laws that have defined India and its people.
laws that everyone should know. Watch 75 years, laws that shaped India. With me, Hemant Batra, only on Sunset TV. Welcome back after the break. And we'll start our discussion with Dr. Sanjay Kalra. Dr. Kalra is a renowned endocrinologist, is the immediate past president of the Endocrine Society of India, and is very well known for his communication skills and patient outreach programs. Dr. Kalra, you've been hearing a lot about the discussion on newer drugs. All of us use them, uh, how they have changed our approach to diabetes. Uh, very good monitoring techniques now, which help us again, you know, more in a more nuanced way, uh, sort of manage diabetes. But are these drugs for everybody, or are they your first instinct, uh, instinctive prescription when a patient comes to you? Is that these new drugs, or is there any other approach that you employ? All these drugs do have their own place, and they are useful. But our first line therapy will be lifestyle optimization. Dr. Mohan just gave us the mantra A, B, C, D. But before A, we have zero. So let me create the O, A, B, C, D mantra. And O is for overcoming weight, overweight. If we need to achieve good glucose control, and if we need to avoid complications, we need to overcome obesity, and of course, manage our HbA1c, blood pressure and cholesterol. These are our targets. And to achieve these targets, we need a healthy lifestyle. What comes in healthy lifestyle? The first is diet, that is sensible sustenance. The second is physical activity, exercise and sports. Let's term that as structured physical activity. And to these two S's, sensible sustenance and structured physical activity, let's add stress management, sleep hygiene and substance abuse prevention. This is the first line. And it will always remain the first line for diabetes prevention and for diabetes management. So, so do you think that, forget the newer drugs, do you, do you think that patients who come to you, for example, uh, or come to us, are with an HbA1c of, let's say, 7, and a 30-year-old, uh, newly diagnosed diabetic, overweight, bad lifestyle, would you rush to prescribe medication? Or would you hold back and try more of lifestyle measures? We hold back. We try more of lifestyle modification. As a physician, as an endocrinologist, when I do not prescribe a drug, it does not mean that I'm abdicating my responsibility. Actually, it means that I'm taking on more than my fair share of responsibility. So my responsibility now is to prescribe a healthy lifestyle and to motivate my patient to follow and to adhere to a healthy lifestyle. This is much more difficult to do. There is always a chance of a remission of diabetes. Let me take this opportunity to talk about some semantics. We do not use the word reversal of diabetes because once there is a pathology in the body, it is difficult to reverse it 100%. So we talk about remission. We also do not use this for every type of diabetes. We use it only for type 2 diabetes. So if your patient has type 1 diabetes or pancreatic diabetes, that will stay. We need medication. But if it is type 2 diabetes, and again, we have this A, B, C, D, E mantra now. A for age, if it is a young adult. B for body weight or body mass index. If the patient is overweight, obese, and is willing to do what it takes to bring the weight down. C is for something known as C-peptide, which talks to us about the strength of the pancreas, the capacity of the pancreas to secrete insulin. If that is maintained, and it is usually maintained in most people with recent onset diabetes, then again there is a chance of remission. And D is for duration of diabetes. If you reach your doctor early, in the first few months or maybe the first year of diabetes, there is a good chance of remission. So young age, high body weight, good C-peptide and low duration. To this the most important thing that we will add is E. E is for energy, enthusiasm, education. Mm -hmm. If you do what it takes to reduce weight, to keep your glucose control, and then to maintain a healthy lifestyle, there is a fairly good chance of going into remission. And we will be able to prevent diabetes 
and we'll certainly be able to prevent the complications of diabetes. I think this is very, very important what you're saying. The message here is very, very clear that in people who are young, who have short duration of diabetes, who have preserved pancreatic function, uh, very often uh, you can at least, if not completely remit, but reduce the requirement for medication very drastically and sometimes even actually go off medication. So this is not unusual. But again, it is important. You have many programs running which say reversal of diabetes. It is not true reversal. We don't know that. It's a probably remission, which means a temporary stage where for one year, two years, five years, maybe even 10 years, you can keep away from diabetes. That's important. The other thing is that not everyone can reverse diabetes. That's very, very important to understand that of the types of diabetes Dr. Mohan was describing, if, if you're talking of the lean diabetic, and as Dr. Kalra said, with low C-peptide, low pancreatic secretion, how would that person reverse their diabetes? It's very difficult. So you need to, again, not be overambitious, but at the same time realize you may well be falling into a group that can possibly go into remission with proper care and lifestyle measures. So I think those are very, very important points, Dr. Kalra, that you made. Uh, the challenge in this whole thing is we keep talking about remission and we're talking about weight reduction and, you know, calories. And you know that very low calorie diets tried in the UK could actually produce a fairly sustained remission. You know, very low calorie diets in the first few months can actually send your diabetes into remission for several months, maybe even years. But those kind of diets are very, very hard to follow, as we know. Similarly, even if you don't do the stringent very low calorie diets, there are sort of less calorie intake diets with all the measures that you described that can send you into some kind of remission for your diabetes. But why don't people do it? You see, the challenge is that day in and day out, we are struggling in our clinics, in our hospital, to get people to follow this. There are obviously things in our mind which are not so simple. Human mind is not so simple that, okay, this is what we prescribe, this is the medication, this is the exercise, the diet. People don't follow it. So where is the role of behavior in all this and behavioral modification? It's uh, the most important thing, actually. And, sir, you've hit the nail on the head. Uh, our mind is wired in different ways. Our mind works to ensure that the body survives. And there are different pathways. One of them is a physiological pathway uh, where the brain tells us you need so many calories in order to survive. You need so much of water in order to survive. So we follow that. But then there's another pathway in the brain which usually uh, supersedes the first one. It's called a hedonistic pathway, which uh, tells us to eat food for pleasure. And eating food is also like an addiction. And we are blessed to live in India. We have the tastiest food in the world, the best <laughs> cuisine in the world. So why would we not want to eat? Why would we not want to drink? Our beverages are the most uh, tasty, the most refreshing. Our food is the most uh, uh, fulfilling. So once you get into this trap of eating food, for the fun of eating food, for enjoyment, it's very difficult to come out of it. How do you do that? There is something known as the metabolic set point in the brain. So do not go all out. You know, Do not uh, go from maybe 10 pranthas or 20 idlis a day down to zero. You might be able to sustain it for a short period of time, but you will rebound. And in uh, physics, Newton's law says... There is an equal and opposite reaction. But in endocrinology, we have a different law. There is a more than equal rebound. 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 <laughs> so if you lose 5 kg, you are going to end up gaining 10 kg. The trick is, you do it in simple and uh, small steps. So maybe today I decide to cut out one prontha from my diet. Tomorrow I decide to cut out the sweet chutney. And maybe next week, I decide to exercise a little bit more. So just keep on doing it in incremental steps. And you will find that this behavioral change will be more sustained. It will be more rewarding. There is also sort of discomfort associated with change. Anytime we have to change, if someone were to ask us maybe to change the clothes that we wear, there's a discomfort. So how do you break down that discomfort? By breaking down the change that is required. I think if we can all follow this, we will be able to achieve a much uh, healthier and a much happier state of affairs. Yeah, I mean, people also get very stressed when they get diabetes, you know that. And, you know, there's a, you can always be in, even in diabetic distress, as you call it. Mm -hmm. Some people get 
the fatigue of chronic disease, the fatigue of managing yeah. diabetes. Would you like to explain those a little bit? Uh, diabetes distress is something that we see in our clinic every day. And it's a coping disorder. There's no disease, there's no illness. It's just that you feel afraid that you will not be able to cope with the demands, with the challenges of living with diabetes. If you feel you cannot cope, what is the solution? Number one, increase your coping skills. Reach out for support to your doctor, to your dietitian, to the diabetes educator. Also, it is the responsibility of the healthcare team to reduce the burden of coping. So we can make diabetes management simpler. And we actually now have very good drugs, very good monitoring devices, which make it very easy to live with diabetes. There's another disease known as orthorexia nervosa. And I would like to caution all our listeners, all our viewers against this. We are aware of anorexia nervosa, where we eat so little and we become so stressed out, we want to lose weight, we end up becoming sicker. Orthorexia nervosa means that you become nervous about eating the right thing. Ortho means upright. So every time you eat, you look at the, the packaging, you look at the labels. Yeah, uh, am obsessed. I eating 40 grams of wheat or 38 grams of wheat? And this puts us in trouble. So enjoy what you do. Just do everything in moderation. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Kalra, you're referring to the obsessive kind of uh, behavioral uh, personalities that we often see in the outpatients. And the problem with those is that while they actually will implement it very well for, for a few weeks, maybe sometimes a few months, it is almost impossible to maintain to sustain. that level of meticulousness you need to enjoy your life. You need to enjoy the good things of life. If you're able to balance that out and use them in moderation, consume the right food, learn to enjoy healthy food. It's not, it's not that it's not tasty. You have to develop a taste for it. Interspersed at times with some cheating, which is allowed, you can probably manage it better. But every person is different. And there will be people who will do very well with a very strict schedule. There will be others who will do much better with the sort of progressive, gradual improvement in lifestyle, like Dr. Kalda mentioned. Diabetes is uh, not a disease of the individual anymore, not even a disease of the family. It's a disease of the country now, of the entire society. And the onus lies upon society to change itself. We need to change our definition of enjoyment, our definition of pleasure, the kind of food that we serve at parties, at marriages. We need to change the opportunities that we give to ourselves to exercise and to practice healthy sports. If we can do that as a, as a society, as a nation, I think we'll win the war against diabetes. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Kamlesh Khunthi. Professor of Primary Care Diabetes and Vascular Medicine at the University of Leicester, UK, to this program. Professor Kunti has experience with managing Indians with diabetes in the UK. Of course, he also has experience of managing Britishers with diabetes, obviously, in the UK. Uh, there are lots of advances in diabetes care in the last decade, uh, and there's a huge shift almost a paradigm shift in drug treatment of diabetes. With the advent of newer molecules like SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1-like drugs, uh, one has changed the approach to diabetes more or less. Uh, in India, for example, SGLT2 inhibitors have picked up a great deal and have become very popularly prescribed drugs for diabetes for a variety of reasons that we know. Where do you place these drugs in your practice in the UK? And do you f see any difference in the responses, again, between native white Britishers versus Asian Indians? And do you see challenges in their widespread adoption in India itself? I think in terms of the therapies that you mentioned, SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists, the, the evidence base of them is amazing. It's, it's incredible. We've advanced our knowledge in terms of saving lives, saving um, uh, kidney disease, saving uh, cardiovascular disease with these therapies in the right people. Um, in the UK, we're very fortunate that we have access, uh, universal access to all therapies. If someone has diabetes, they can have all the therapies free of charge. 
Despite that, we haven't seen a huge update uh, until recently. We've had the SGL2 inhibitor evidence for over five years now, and they're just about taking off now. GLP-1 receptor agonists until now have been injectable therapies. And uh, for various reasons, people do not like injectable therapies. But now we do have a molecule which is an oral-based GLP-1 receptor agonist, and we'll have to wait and see what the uptake of that is. In terms of um, the limitations, we have the same limitations anywhere else. Cost is a major issue. Uh, most of the prescribing happens in primary care, not by the apatologist. And we're looking after people as a holistic. So they don't only have diabetes, they'll have uh, four or five other conditions as well. And we have to balance the cost accordingly. But in the right people, and the right people are people with established cardiovascular disease or kidney disease or heart failure. These therapies are tremendous. In terms of uh, your question regarding India, I think the issues are similar, uh, but more pronounced in India is the issue of cost, it's affordability of these therapies. Although I know you do have generic uh, SGLT2 inhibitors now, but they haven't been proven um, like they have been with the, the branded versions that we are using. Uh, as you know, uh, we thought they were all the same molecules, have a recent trials have come up with a false molecule, articular closing, which didn't show the same impact. So we really need to be careful in terms of using the molecules that have the best evidence base. So let me ask you a little bit more about oral semaglutide, the latest GLP-1. That, that has done away with the barrier of injectable therapy. Uh, and the results are astounding in terms of weight loss and HbA1c lowering. Yet we know that uh, gastrointestinal, gastric side effects as we call them, uh, nausea, vomiting, dyspepsia, they are quite common in people who are on semaglutide. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you see that as being a major limitation to widespread adoption of these molecules? I mean, certainly we haven't got as much experience with the oral um, GLP-1 receptor agonist as we have with injectable. But certainly we've seen with injectable is the side effect profile, as you mentioned, the nausea, the diarrhea, the fullness, um, some people getting vomiting as well. That certainly has had a reduction in adoption. Also, we have about 30% of people who stop these therapies after six months because they uh, are having these side effects. On the positive side, because they have such a tremendous impact on weight, when there's a weight benefit, and we can't tell who will benefit in terms of weight or HbA1c, when there's a weight benefit, people tend to see the benefits immediately and they tend to continue these therapies despite having some of the side effects we've mentioned. I suspect some of these drugs will end up being primary anti-obesity agents also. So we come to the end of this second episode. In this, we learned about new drugs to treat diabetes. We learned about new technologies to monitor diabetes. We also learned a lot about preventing complications of diabetes. And on top of that, the importance of strict lifestyle measures, strict but manageable lifestyle measures, and the relationship of weight to diabetes. I think that's really important to remember. Uh, I'd like to thank our three experts of the day, uh, Dr. V. Mohan, Dr. Kamlesh Kunthi, and Dr. Sanjay Kalra. Thank you very much. Next time, we'll discuss various aspects of vitamin D. Uh, vitamin D, as we know, is a very important vitamin for our body, but not just for our bone and muscle, but for various other organs. Uh, and Indians are prone to D deficiency. Hear about this and a lot more in our next episode of Healthy India.